My name is Tony Penny. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the Foundation. And on behalf of our entire team, welcome to what has become one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, before we get to our wonderful speaker and dear friend, Dr. Gordon Lloyd, it's tradition at the Foundation that we begin each of our events with the Pledge of Allegiance. So in order to honor our men and women in uniform, I'm going to ask Rosemary and Beatrice to come up and please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So today is the 231st anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. The oldest, the shortest, oh, there, yeah, yeah, there we go. It's a birthday. It's a birthday party for the Constitution. Uh, so it's the oldest, the shortest, and in my humble opinion, the finest governing document ever created. In fact, I think everybody who's here should have had a copy of it. Uh, imagine the whole, the whole history of American governance right here in this document, right? It fits right in your pocket. It's wonderful. 31 years ago, during remarks at the bicentennial celebration of the Constitution, President Reagan said, quote, active and informed citizens are vital to the effective functioning of our constitutional system. All of us have an obligation to study the Constitution and participate actively in the system of self-government that it establishes. This is an obligation we owe not only to ourselves, but to our children and their children. Our speaker tonight takes this obligation very seriously. In fact, his work on teachingamericanhistory.org is regularly viewed by not hundreds, not thousands, not tens of thousands, but by hundreds of thousands of visitors, teachers, and students each year, making it arguably the best and most visited website for learning about the founding of this country. A story some of you may be familiar with, at the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention, after months of secretive deliberation behind closed doors and curtains at Independence Hall, the framers emerged, and Ben Franklin, who was the oldest of the signers at 81 years old, exited the hall, and there was a woman standing there who shouted, Dr. Franklin, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Franklin, who at the time was arguably the most famous American in the country, some might argue George Washington, and you can take either side. <laughs> Barely able to walk because of gout, he had to be carried many days to the convention on a, on a sedan, replied, a republic if you can keep it. Few have done more to keep it than our favorite professor, one of our most beloved guests here at the foundation, and a good friend uh, who I have many important board meetings with. Uh, a couple times a year we have to go and have a board meeting to discuss the Constitution and many other things. He's been back so many times, in fact, that when we were looking for a little thank you gift to give him, we walked through the store and said, I think he has almost everything in here. <laughs> back to share his work, his thoughts, his unique style with this year's topic, the least dangerous branch, question mark. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gordon Lloyd to give his ninth annual Constitution Day address. Thank you. Thank you all for your generosity and for coming this evening. Um, what I want to do is to introduce this topic that it's going to be a success because Tony chose the topic. And he chose a topic last year, the lost art of compromise. And I thought that went over very well indeed. And so, the, so we put a question mark at the end, which is always nice to be able to answer a question with a question. You're not supposed to do that, but in this particular case, you can, you can ask, answer the question, <coughs> least dangerous branch question mark, and you can ask another question, for whom? 
or what? And from the time you start mentioning the word danger, then I think you're already down the road to some, shall we say, uh, I don't want to use the word value, some, some, something that you hold near and dear, you know, liberty, equality, that is deemed to be in jeopardy or danger because of something or some activity. And I, I want to, <coughs> the, the, the phrase itself is usually associated with Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Number 78, in which he's responding to uh, an opponent who goes by the name of Brutus. You know, you, the, the synonyms and, uh, that were being used all around that, that time. Very interesting, very little Greek. Um, Madison said if every Athenian were Socrates, it would still be a mob. They emulated Rome. So you get these names, these pseudonyms of Rome, Cato. Uh, Hamilton was brash enough to start up with letters written Caesar. And that led to somebody else writing Brutus. We all know what Brutus did to Caesar until Madison came along and said, stop it. Be moderate. Be sensible. And Hamilton would say, whoever went down the street and said, let's hear it for moderation. <laughs> but uh, Madison came up with Publius, who was the savior of Rome. So the phrase, the least dangerous branch, is associated with Hamilton in Federalist 78, responding to Brutus. And Brutus is raising the question, <coughs> isn't the judiciary the most dangerous branch of all? because it is unelected, and you have, it's very, very difficult to remove a judge once in office. And therefore, it must be at least on the, if you write, put a scale of, this is more democratic Republican, this is less democratic Republican. Brutus's claim is that on the scale of measurement, your judiciary at least appears on the surface to be a dangerous, a dangerous branch because it is not elected and there are no rotation office or term limits. And Hamilton's response is, we can permit the judiciary to have independence in terms of life terms or good behavior because it is the least dangerous branch, because it has neither the sword, the president, nor the purse, the Congress, but only judgment. Therefore, it is the least dangerous because danger comes from the sword or danger comes from the purse. Danger cannot come from good judgment. And, and they're governed by precedent. So they're going to be slow and careful. And, um, and you begin to wonder, well, what is it then that the judges do I mean, why do you want them if they're going to be do nothing? And, and Hamilton's point is, um, well, they will render judgment and they will, they will uh, declare those laws which violate, quote, the manifest tenor, unquote, of the Constitution to be unconstitutional. And where else are you going to find, find that? And so it's not dangerous. You need it in a constitutional republic. And besides, Congress will never let it happen. Congress will never let the judiciary become dangerous. And um, well, we could uh, debate that question. Um, may, the issue may not be make America great again, but make Congress great again. And how does one, how does one do that? And it's very interesting. I read a, 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 a comment in the, in, in the newspaper the, the other day by a senator who has, who has the wonderful name of John Kennedy. And he said, um, I want to make sure that the nominee who's in front of us um, is qualified to be appointed and here's what the, the, the senator said. Qualified to be appointed to the most powerful, 
unelected position in the most powerful country in all human history. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like the least dangerous branch. That sounds like a very dangerous branch. And what constitutes then a qualification for that position? And then when I look at, bless you, bless you, um, except you should commit it to memory. The, 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 when I look and I see, well, what is the qualification for a member of the House? There's an age qualification. There is a residence qualification. And there's a citizenship qualification. If I look for a senator, same thing, slightly different in terms of age. If I look for president, it's exactly the same thing, slightly different, plus natural born. If I look to see, well, what's the qualification for a justice? Zero. There is nothing in the Constitution which says a judge must have the following qualification of age, resident, citizenship, or anything. But clearly, there is a presumption that some level of qualification is needed in order to be a judge, in order to occupy the least dangerous branch. Question one. So that's how I want to introduce it. Now, so there's a debate. There's a debate then, and I think there's a debate now. And uh, what did, reading the, the Economist the other day, and it's very straight, the Economist, which I would consider to be center, and the LA Times, which I consider to be center left, left. The, uh, they both agreed what needs to be done about the judiciary. The answer is term limits. And I was absolutely surprised that these two, these two new, new, reputable, at least economists, reputable, uh, would come up with term limits. Why? Why? Because when we go back to Tony's introduction about Franklin, a republic if you can keep it, there is one understanding at that time and today in The Economist and The Times is that the further you go away from two-year terms or four-year terms or six-year terms, the more you are on the dangerous and slippery slope to becoming a non-republic or an aristocracy or a monarchy or an elite or something along those lines. So I find it fascinating that this idea of term limits is so associated with a Republican, and by Republican I mean a Democratic Republic. I don't mean, uh, right, I mean it's the opposite to being a pure democracy but on a spot, participatory. It's the it's elections, which, which is the key to, 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 um, to, to this. So I'm, I'm surprised that this idea that Franklin would have and others would have at the founding, that term limits, in other words, where, where annual elections end, tyranny begins, is a theme which runs through a certain part of the founding, and I would associate with Franklin, at least in a republic if you can keep it. Now, the word republic means essentially raise things, public, public, public things, and its opposite is understood to be monolithic rather than public, and that was monarchy. They rule by one. So they, in a sense, a republic is the opposite of a monarchy. So how do you keep a republic? For frankly, it is public service. Therefore, education becomes important. You don't ask, how much am I going to get paid for this job? You do it. It is the old Aristotelian notion. You rule and are ruled in turn. You serve, and then you come back. It doesn't matter whether it's a farm or a, a, a legal institution or a, a professorship. You don't take it to become a professional politician. You do it for the public good. But that requires then that <laughs> government is not too complicated. That you can, you can actually rotate yourself in office and without, without somehow massive dislocation taking place. All right. A um, <laughs> The least dangerous branch, question mark, associated with Hamilton, giving you his argument. Brutus is not convinced. 
long terms in office. Today, you're still talking about that term, ter terms in office. So let us, let, I'm going to pick up on Tony's point about Franklin, and let's go to the signing. By the way, it's sort of, it's fascinating. The signing occurred on Monday, the 17th of September. So it's one of those uh, rare events that you are participating in. And uh, as Tony said, this is my ninth, and I feel as if it's, I feel it's cl I'm closer to the founding than. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the Christie painting. It's, it's, the, it's the one I love the most. It's the most famous of them all, but very few people see it because it's hanging in Congress. <clears throat> if we were to uh, focus on this painting, is it possible to, to focus a bit more? Uh, or we would just leave it at that? I, I, I'm wondering, is it, can, you, can you sort of focus in? Yeah, there you go. All right, now, there's, there, there, there's some, this is by Howard Christie, who was known basically, this is what they were called, it's not my terminology, the Christie girls. They were, they were uh, selling war bonds. If, if I were a man, I'd be in the Navy, those kinds of things. That's, that's the reason he's known for his portraits. And he was commissioned to do this portrait of the founding, um, the signing. When? During the, by, during the, um, uh, the 150th anniversary, during the Depression, when thoughts were that America is about to collapse, things are dangerous. Um, by the way, when I'm thinking about this, if you ask Franklin Roosevelt, um, what is the most dangerous branch? He said the judiciary. And he described it when he was trying to reorganize the judiciary, and he, he described it this way. Government is like a chariot a three-horse chariot with the American people holding the reins. We have one horse, the Congress, and another horse, the President, both moving and pulling in the same direction. We have the court, however, going in the opposite direction. Is that any way to run a government and solve this and solve that and do the other? The court is the most dangerous branch because it is getting in the way of we, the people. It's fascinating that Tony and I have talked about to compare and contrast Ronald Reagan's 200th anniversary speech on the, uh, on the, on the Constitution with Roosevelt's 150th anniversary speech. And fascinating, the most dangerous branch for both of them is the judiciary. And it, and, but, but for different reasons. And the solution that each one had was different for different reasons. Roosevelt was packed and darn thing. And if, they, and if we don't get away with it, we'll have sent a message and they'll learn it. And Reagan's answer is what has now become known as originals. Yeah, de de deference to the legislature, or particularly state legislatures. All right. So in the front here, there's a poetical it's a signing license and everything, and, and I won't go into all of that. But what I want to show is in the front is Hamilton and Franklin. And you think about that. Well, Franklin's fame is not from the convention, as we were told. He was carried there half the darn time. And somebody gave his, wrote his speeches, if not to denigrate him, but he was not what we would call a critical thinker at the convention. His fame came from what he did before the convention. Hamilton's real fame came after the convention, as Secretary of, of the Treasury and building up the U.S. Uh, of the bank and everything, getting it, it, the whole question of what is the role of government, it, not just which branch, but what is the whole role of government itself in, in, to, to be involved in. So that the, the license is these two, and I'm I'm wondering. What, what kind of conversation might they have? Now, Hamilton is from the Caribbean. And Angela's looking at me, don't go there. Don't go. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't go down that road. Don't go down that road there. But I'm going. I'm going down that road. 
So Hamilton turns to Franklin. I'm from the Caribbean also, so don't worry about that. So, so Hamilton turns to Franklin and says, so Ben then, you're going outside soon. You're going to see somebody. My name is not Ben. It's Doctor. OK, Doc. What you go tell them? A republic, if, I can, if you can keep it. And you, Colonel Hamilton, what will you say to the people? The answer is, a monarchy, if I can get it. <laughs> yeah, la, 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 la. So for those of you who have seen Hamilton. <clears throat> so you got this, an elected monarchy. Except, so Jefferson is not there. He's in Paris, waiting for revolution. But his books are on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Christie, from his library. But what would Jefferson say? Jefferson's response is, I have never been a supporter of energetic government, of good government. It's always been oppressive. And you ask Hamilton, well, where are you going to get energetic, good government, strong government from? The answer is the executive branch. And that's why Jefferson told Madison, I like the Constitution, but there are a couple of things I wish were there. A Bill of Rights to restrain the whole reach of government. So the whole idea of a central government is dangerous. This idea of saying that this branch or that branch or that branch misses the point that the whole government itself is potentially dangerous and corrupting. And so you. So you need to pay attention, says Madison, says Jefferson, to a Bill of Rights to restrain government, period. Never mind the branch. Government, period. And, and secondly, I really wish that you'd had rotation in office for the executive. So he'll be faced with this rotation in office question again. Not just for the judges, but for the president. We finally get that with Roosevelt. It's fascinating to me. A lot of the progressive agenda in the early 20th century was done through amendments, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th amendments. We get the, 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 the changing of the fundamental constitution constitutionally through the amendment to the constitution. In the Roosevelt FDR, we get a changing of the constitution by interpretation more than by amendment. Ironically, the one amendment that comes through the Roosevelt administration is the limiting of the president to two terms. And that's, I just find those, I find those ironies in life to, 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 to be wonderful and, and, and to be delicious. And then we got, right over the shoulder is the real hero, Mr. Madison. What does he want? He wants balanced government. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little touch here, a little touch there. Why? Because he wants moderate government. Well, what's so important about moderate government? Well, it doesn't get out of hand. So therefore, yes, you have the judiciary. Yes, you also have a president. But this is Madison's point. There is no inherent executive power in the executive. By that means, every power that is for the president is written into the Constitution. You cannot presume that the, that the president is the American equivalent of the British monarch. The British monarch has inherent power. And one of the fascinating things that's been happening for both conservatives and liberals over the last 60, 70 years, in my opinion, has been this quest for inherent power in the presidency. It depends, of course, whether your person is in office or not which is very unfortunate, but that is the case, that they've found inherent powers. And you can, we can go through it and see how they get this. And where's the text? You got the text in front of you. How would one possibly read it that way? George Mason, another person interested in the Bill of Rights, would argue that, the, the, to use his language, the presidency is the, contains the fetus of monarchy. Why? Because who's going to restrain the president when we have war? 
Is Congress going to restrain the president? Hasn't Congress, in effect, given up its war powers? What? Think about it. A fundamental shift did occur, in my opinion, in 1933 with the election of Roosevelt. Because we remember his first inaugural, in which he says, all we have to fear is fear itself. That's what we, we learned. But I think the most important phrase in that speech was, what the American people want is action, and action now. And that changes the whole idea of what the purpose of the federal government is, what the whole purpose of the executive is, what constitutes executive leadership is to be commander in chief. And after that, you don't only have war against some identifiable enemy, but you have a war on poverty, a war on drugs, a war on no child left behind, you have a war on war. And where do you put the power for this? Apparently, in the executive. So why don't we come to grips with this and say, the judiciary isn't the most dangerous branch. Is it? Surely it's the executive which is the most dangerous branch. Isn't it? But they are term limits, aren't there? So why don't we have term limits on the judiciary? Do you think that's going to solve the issue? Why do we have term limits in California for all sorts of things? Has that solved what the basic problem was supposed to solve? Does it make us feel better? Yes, because it makes us think that it's a republic and we're keeping it. But I think a lot of the times it depends upon not just mechanisms, or what I would call, in more eloquent language, filters. As you've got a House, you've got a House and a Senate, the House and the Senate have got to agree, then you've got a delay, and then the executive has to agree, and then it can be overturned, and then you've got the judiciary. So you've got all these filtration systems in to secure what Madison would call republicanism, which is to secure the deliberate sense of the community. So if you were to say a republic, if you can keep it, Mr. Madison would say a balance here, a balance there, a balance there. A republic, if you can keep it, means can you maintain the deliberate sense of the community? The idea of instant government, that you just get, this is your decision. Now, gather on the spot, Athens, 6,000 people, Socrates, you're dead, is not what Madison would consider to be republicanism, if you can keep it. So you need these branches of government. And so, no, here, here's the point. Madison would say, you cannot get the judiciary to be the most dangerous branch. You cannot get the executive to be the most dangerous branch. The most dangerous branch in a properly constructed democratic republic is going to be the legislative branch. Why? They write the laws. They, they, do, they, they, they can do all sorts of things. They can override a presidential veto without, interesting, an amending the Constitution. Is the president involved in an amendment to the Constitution? No. Is, are the judiciary involved in an amendment to the Constitution? No. Who's involved in an amendment to the Constitution? Two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three quarters of the state legislatures. Who or what is the most dangerous branch? The legislative branch. Because they have the clout. So it's not possible, says Madison, to give to the executive and the judiciary that kind of independence that you're scared of. Because Congress will never let it happen. And Congress is, I would love to see the day when, just, just for the sake of discussion, Congress passes an amendment to the Constitution and the Supreme Court declares the amendment unconstitutional. Who own one of the most dangerous thoughts I have 
witnessed over the last 20, 30 years is that we live under a constitution, but the constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. I would argue we live under a constitution, and the constitution is whatever two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, and three-quarters of the state legislature says it is, regardless of what the Supreme Court. Ah, but we're always at war. Therefore, the Constitution is what the personalized presidency says it is. But couldn't we do something about that? Well, apparently, we are not willing to do something about it. We don't, members of Congress apparently don't understand the role of Congress, which I think is a shame. And one of our jobs as teachers is to try, not just for the mechanics of it, because we're talking about dangerous branch. That's mechanic. But what I was also want to talk about is you can't talk about mechanics without character. Some people prefer to say values, and inconsistent with our values. I want to talk about character. That is the character of the people, the genius of the people, the sense of the people. And Madison's understanding is that we, the people, have enough sense to elect individuals, question mark, do we? <laughs> have enough sense and virtue, that is um, decency, to elect people of sense and virtue in order to carry out the public good. And all the better, my dear, to make sure you're doing that, we have regular elections. Think about it. One of the few countries in the world, come rain, come shine, come war, come peace, every two years you have an election. Guaranteed, every two years. And what have we done with the, you know, president, the congressional elections? We have become so enamored that the presidency is the only game in town that we call it midterm. Or sometimes off year. Or if we really are putting it down ballot, as if the only game in town is the presidency. There are lots that we can talk about. Let's take a look. Just to, if you want to keep doing this, just for a moment. Let's take a look at ratification of the Constitution. I, I'm very proud of this one for a moment. Could you just click? Just, just type in. I, I'm going to take a gamble. Just type in ratification of a. I'm mean, Derek. It's all right. It's all right. It really is. It's all right. Just, just Google ratification of the Constitution. I'm not going to go into a West Indian accent. No, you're, 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 you're all right. All right. I thought it was going to be easier than that. Just, just, just type it ratification of the Constitution. Yeah, there you go. Ah! Students are very impressed. Look at the number up there. Because you, it's not fake news with Google. <laughs> right? I mean, if you see, if you see the number, that's twelve minutes. So if we were to look at at right state studies, it out of doors. There you go, out of doors. You go, if, if you click out of doors, there you go, and we were to scroll down, what happened? No, we don't want indoors, we want out of doors debate. Tony, this is ninth year. <laughs> here we go, here we go. All right, so <laughs> scroll, scroll down, please. Down is that one. <laughs> Okay, yeah, in this section, issues debated. Okay, let's click on the last one there, yeah, click that one. So if you want to look at the issue debate, purpose, structure, and powers of government, if you click that one, thank you. Yeah, just click that. What I've done is to put, yeah, yeah scroll down one more time. We're, good, we're nearly there. So I've put together a set of questions. So for example, what about the role of the executive? You want to have a debate about the role of the executive. This is what you'd look at. An old wig, powdered, and Federalist 71. The separation of powers, Brutus and Federalist 51. The role of the second branch. 
I've always got confused about this. The anti-federalists are supposed to be states' rights. The Senate is a states' rights branch. Yet, this, that, yet the anti-federalists reserve some of their most telling criticism for the Senate. Why? Because they weren't there for six years. And they could become aristocratic. And don't, they didn't have regular turnover. So if you, role of the judiciary, brutus and federalist, that's one of the things that we do. So for students who are interested in trying to explore this question of the most dangerous branch, of the separation of powers, what, what is available on the site is a debate, a set of, a, a set of uh, pros and cons concerning, concerning an issue. And that would mean the ratification of the Constitution. If you wanted to think about, so where does this whole idea of the Bill of Rights come from? It comes that the whole idea of government itself, the federal government, is potentially too strong. That you don't want to get into this branch or that branch or another branch as much as you want to say, what is the proper role of the federal government? Now that is not a question which is burning today, but it was a burning question in the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century. It may come back, things have a way of coming and going. But if, 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 that, if, if you want to take a look at the whole role of the Bill of Rights and the role of government, you could take a look at the Bill of Rights website. Type, type this. Okay. Origin and politics of the Bill of Rights. All right. Let's see. 168 million? Ha! <laughs> Right. So you want to see what it is? All right. Let's 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 click on here. Here, if you just, just just for sake, just, just as they say, for so, just for so. If you want to figure out what, if if I want to find out due process of law, an American sort of uh, documentary understanding of where I would find due process of law. Click due process of law. And he said, Magna Carta, English Petition of Rights, Massachusetts Body of Liberty. He'll tell you. And then you click on that, you'll see the whole charter, where you would find it. And there are two kinds of right. One I would call due process rights, which come from the English tradition. That would be Magna Carta, which is trying to create reasonable government. And then there is natural right, which is to say no government should be dealing with this at whatever level, at whatever branch. It's off the table kind of rights. And that you won't get from the English tradition. That you'll get that as something peculiarly American. So this issue of which branch is most dangerous, we have to qualify with a question mark. Which level um, are we talking about the judiciary? Why is the judiciary potentially the most dangerous? because it could be independent of the people themselves. Why is the executive the most dangerous? Because it could be independent of the people themselves. Why is Congress the most dangerous? Because it could be independent of the people themselves. How do you get, how do you manage to get independent branches without them being independent of the people? Question mark. How do you get separation of powers? And yet one branch is going to dominate or should dominate in a democratic republic, namely the Congress. How can you call that separation of powers? Doesn't separation of powers mean co-equal branches? Where do we get that from? Maybe Madison. Let me end this uh, so that we can have some time for questions. I hope I've put forward a number of things here for us to chat about. Um, September the 17th, 231 years ago, I remember it well. <laughs> it, was, um, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and if, we go, if we were to go back to the, uh, if we were to go to the, the city tavern, and, and the, the, I thought I had discovered something really, really great. Uh, with George Washington's farewell dinner. And, you know, there are 55 delegates, and I've discovered this, this, uh, this menu. 
it was held at the city tavern where they, after the signing, they all went there and everything. And resources of the convention. You go down there, see entertainment of George Washington at the city tavern. And you, you come down, here's the, here's, here's the menu. I managed to get it in. You ready? And relishes and olives, 20 pounds, 12 and 6. 55, 54 bottles of Madeira, which poor son got left out. 60 bottles of claret, eight bottles of old stock, 22 bottles of porter, eight bottles of cider, 12 bottles of beer, seven large bowels of punch, I bet. <laughs> Cigars, spelling was not the frame, frame was most, uh, shall we say, strong point. Uh, cigars, spermacity, candles, etc. You decanters of wine glasses and tumblers broken. To 16 servants and musicians. They said a few to them, we pay our servants. We pay our musicians. 60 bottles of claret is what we pay them. Eat one bottle per person. Yeah, yeah, five bottles of Madeira. Seven bowls of punch. Here's the bill. And if you if you if keep coming down, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, and, and then here, if you if you keep if you keep going down some more, yes. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So I got a I got a letter from George Christliff, the person on the name, the, the, George Christliff the seventeenth or something, writes to me and says, "What do you know about my great 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 great?" I said, "I have no idea, but I'm, I'm sure you're going to tell me." And he says, yeah. I, he says, well, he was part of a crowd that came over that was hired by uh, George, uh, George III as mercenaries to fight the, the British during the Revolutionary War. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is incredible. Look at it. Christian, Schultz, Schindler, Kaiser, Hartung, Arati, Kaisrock. Brunner, Spattenberg, what are all these Germans doing there? <laughs> and the answer is, they were caught. So they were in prison. And then when the peace treaty was signed, they were offered their release, and they decided to become Americans instead. Thank you. So we have enough time for a couple of questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and our team will come around with a microphone. Just make sure you say it into the microphone. So I'll volunteer at once. Yeah, in light of the uh, situation with the judgeship now coming on, you know he's going to be there for life, right? Uh, so do you think that's? I mean, you're opposed to term limits for them, right? Yes. You're, me too. So I'm just wondering, uh, because there's enough diversion in their, their political views, right? Well, here, 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 here's my answer to you. Theoretically, if I could have my way, I'd give them I'd, 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 um, no term limits because they're the least dangerous branch. However, question mark. We have started, a precedent has a big role to play. Once you let a branch start doing something, then it becomes part of their normal playbook. So even if Kavanaugh says Roe versus Wade is precedent, there are different ways in which you can uh, nipple at the edges. So what is the qualification? Answer my questions. But Congress doesn't seem to want to Ask the questions. I, I, I just, okay, or we don't want to upset people. I mean, this is Dear Amy, Dear Abby. Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't want. I, I don't want to upset a judge. How do I want to? And the answer is seek therapy. I'm curious if you have thoughts about. Um, hearing arguments that m the judicial review finding in Marbury versus Madison, not seeing the evidence in the Constitution, but obviously Federalist 78, you do see that. If, if you had any thoughts about did, Mar did Marbury versus Madison give the Supreme Court power that the Constitution didn't intend to give them? 
Well, that, that's an extremely important question, a very, very good one. And um, I am going to try to be quick on it, OK? I challenge the understanding that judicial review was created by Marbury versus Madison. I uh, tend to accept the, the view that it was in the air, at least, between 1776 and 1787, although not exercised widely, and certainly no act of Congress was overturned. But the idea was in the air. I th so I challenge the notion that Marbury versus Madison is the is the place to go. And one of the you know, I anticipated that question. So I wrote something down. And that is that uh, this whole notion of the judiciary and the dangerous friend. And in the in the Virginia ratifying convention, which was in the summer of 1788, John Marshall was there. So this is 15 years before Marbury versus Madison, right? And John Marshall is responding to the claim that the judiciary is the most dangerous branch. It gives it, and I will read the passage to you if you wish, in, in, in the Constitution, which gets Brutus and everybody upset. But Marshall says, to what quarter, which means to what branch, will you look for protection from an infringement on the Constitution if you will not give that power to the judiciary? There is no other body that can afford such a protection. This is John Marshall in the summer of 1788. This is 15 years before Marbury versus Madison. So judicial review at least was in the air, if not put into practice. Marbury versus Madison may have been the first act of Congress, so to speak. Um, where in the Constitution would one find such a power? All right. Thanks, right? Article 1, con Article 2, President. I mean, really, it's straightforward. Article 1, longest, Congress. Article 2, shorter, sweeter, the executive. Article 3 comes third, shorter still, the judiciary. Article 4, relationship between the states. Article 5, how do I change it? Article 6, who's boss? Article 7, let's get out of here. So where would you look for the judicial power? Article 3. All right, so let's. This is what I mean, getting to know, getting to know you, all about you. OK, so you go and you look to Article 3, and you see it says the following. Article 3, Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. Now, the phrase or the words judicial review aren't specifically stated there. Well. It's a guy called Edwin Cohen in the 1880s came up with a term. So it's highly unlikely that 100 years prior that you're going to find the words judicial and review. You won't find the words executive privilege either, right? So you have to say, well, is there the equivalent? And Brutus would say, it says here, your judicial power should extend to all cases in law and equity and arising this constitution, is not an invitation to the judiciary to go fishing and to decide whatever it is that they want to decide, cases and controversies under this constitution. And Madison's response to that is, well, I'll tell you what their response is. When did that phrase come up? One of the things I, I like to do is, all right, when did that, when did that phrase arise during the Constitutional Convention? What could, what could they have said else? Who came up with that? A guy called William Johnson from Connecticut. He came up with that phrase. And Madison stopped him and said, this is August the 27th. And he says, aren't you, aren't you trying to do a bit too much here? You say, all cases? 
And Johnson said, I'm only referring to cases of a judicial nature. I'm not referring to all cases, political cases. Oh, so you're making a distinction between political cases and judicial cases. And Johnson would say yes. And as a result of that distinction, it passed without a, without a murmur. Brutus comes along and says, I'm going to murmur. It says all cases. You're giving an invitation. And Hamilton responds, <laughs> right, you know what? If grandma had wheels, she'd be a trolley car. What are we talking about? You're inventing things. It's a controversy. Um, so I have a question, um, maybe a little bit of a setup here. Um, not, 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 not in that way, just I would, I'd like to preference, preface a little bit. Um, with the expansion of the Dormant Commerce Clause, the incorporation of various uh, amendments against the states after the Civil War, um, the passage of the 16th Amendment, and basically the total disregard for the 10th Amendment, would you even consider the United States to be a republic anymore? Uh, Yeah, 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 but it's becoming more difficult to keep. And I think the answer is because we have shifted our language from republic versus monarchy to democracy versus totalitarianism, or something like that. So that democracy, instead of being a word which meant ruled by people on the spot unthinkingly, has become now a positive word. So one might say that the framers tried to save, the framers tried to make democracy safe for the world. Woodrow Wilson wanted to make the world safe for democracy. So I think the key, if, it, if are we still a republic, is it depends upon the nature and quality of A, the representative system, and B, the nature and quality of the character of the people themselves. Do we want, do we want to deliberate? And, and it's not just participate, but that is true, that's important. Participate intelligently. And want to participate in what is going on and have deliberations. That becomes more and more difficult when you have 300 million plus to have a discussion. Particularly if one is encouraged to press a button and this is your opinion, and you tally them up, and this is what is going to happen. It becomes more and more difficult to deliberate. In addition, it becomes more and more difficult to have representation. The goal was one representative for 30,000, one representative for 60,000. We're now at one representative for 600,000. Sadly, the only way in which that will work is if half the people don't register to vote and half the people don't show up to vote. It's the only way in which some kind of representation is going to occur. And I find that unsatisfactory. So we're in difficulty. But I think there are two, there, there, there are, um, I think the approach is, two, it's, it's twofold. One, it is civic education. <laughs> civic education and civic participation. That is, what is it that we're going to teach <clears throat> our, our young? And uh, um, Jefferson's point is that, it, look, Madison is the same. If you're going to turn over for the first time in the history of the world, albeit nowhere near as expansive as the electorate is in 2018, but in terms of the history of the world in 1787, that was the most expansive electorate the world has ever seen in terms of representation and electorate, both in Britain. So if you're going to have that, it requires that the people themselves be properly educated. How would you, I mean, the, the original Greek meaning of the word democracy meant crassy, which means rule, by the demos, which means the many who are poor and stupid. I mean, that is the Greek translation, not, not mine, all right? 
the many who are poor and stupid. Who in their right mind would want to be ruled by the many who are poor and stupid on the spot? Just saying off with his head. So the answer is, how do you have filtering systems? And how do you have, I mean, there's a great piece in this week's Atlantic dealing with Madison and the, the whole idea of his, his concern about a mob and what a mob is. And a mob is not just simply people going with placards. It is the, he says, if I were to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, I'm confident that we would have a deliberate sense of a community emerging from a discussion. But if I get you with 20 people on the spot and the decision is going to be made, you're going to turn into a different person. The whole character of mass society. So I think that in order to keep a republic, you, you have to avoid instant gratification, instant decision making, turn back, turn back. What I would love to see is members of Congress loving Congress. Right? I mean, think about, I mean, I could, I'm amazed that over the last 15, 20 years, and the number of members of Congress and the Senate who want to become president. What's wrong with being a senator? And then, oh, Joe Biden wants to become vice president. I mean, I, I, so my, my, my problem is that people are starting to look upon the House and the Senate, and the Senate in particular, as stepping stones for other jobs, which suggests that we have we've become more of an administrative state and less of a Republican state. So I'm not saying that it's, I'm taking you very seriously, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, see? So I cannot be, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. I cannot be pessimistic. I cannot understand why Americans have given up on America. Let's go to the Statue of Liberty. See, stay away. America is failing. No way. No way. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic for a variety of reasons. I'm optimistic because I'm a teacher. I'm optimistic because I think that if you talk to people one on one or you or members of Congress behave like members of Congress instead of party, that's another thing. Party has replaced institutional loyalty. Can you imagine, talking about this least dangerous brand, I was just thinking about it the other day. When Earl Warren became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the 1950s, Eisenhower appointed him as an interim appointment. You, can you imagine that happening today? I, you had a question. I'd love to hear it. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, so do you believe that in, uh, incorporation of the amendments under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment violates the state's ability to kind of make their own uh, rules and constitutions? Well, I, I think the answer is not just under the due process, but equal protection. I think that, I think that's what, what, what again, you talk about ironies. The 14th Amendment ends by saying that Congress shall have the authority to enforce this amendment. I mean, it's, it's here, right? right? Just, just read it. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah. um, but who enforces that amendment and by what means? So the answer is yes. And I think what we have to ask is the following sort of set of, set of questions. What should government do? Which level of government should do it? And which branch of which level should do it? And is that permanent? Or can we shift up and down? And if there's war, if there's not, I mean, Madison's point is that the powers of the general government are few and defined. The powers of the state governments are many and undefined. Federalist 45, often quoted. In that very next paragraph, it says, but all this changes in war. And we have to say that the 10th Amendment says it, it, those powers not delegated are reserved to the states or to the people. What if we, the people, 
decide that we want something done at the general level rather than the state level? What if we, the people, decide we don't want it being done at the general level anymore? We want it to be done at the state level. To what extent do we, the people, have the opportunity to ratchet up, ratchet down? Or is that just dream world stuff of mine? That once you ratchet things up, you can't ratchet it back down. And once you involve the court in it, then they're going to have a precedent. And it's just silly for me to even talk about, about restraining the court. I, mean, I don't see how you... Um, that was the last question. <laughs> right? Or you want another one? You have another question. Yes, I do, Dr. Lloyd. Thank you so much. And I, my question is, we have students here from middle school to seniors in high school. What should their responsibilities be and duties to help keep our country the way we want it to be and related to the Constitution? Read my website. That's, I think that's it. That's a good way to end, right? Check out the website. Thank you for your optimism, as always. Thank you for your wonderful lecture.